talking to Christina earlier, and I said, that tabernacle thing where you're in a tent here at Church of the Brethren, and you're outside, and you're on Zoom, and it's great to be in the house of the Lord. I feel kind of back in the, the temple, um, worshiping in, in our space where we feel, uh, we feel God's presence. God's presence is everywhere. Bidden or not, God is present, but sometimes it just feels really good. And the chancel choir is back, so it all makes me very happy. I, through the abundance of thy steadfast love, will enter thy house. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness, and make thy way straight before me.
Thank you so much, Chancellor Choir. That was beautiful. Good morning. Welcome to Lorraine Avenue Mennonite Church for our All Saints Sunday service. Clearly, I am not Eric Crawford. He was feeling a little under the weather, so I'm filling, filling in for him today. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. I will begin with the light print, and I invite you to join me with the bold print. And please note that partway through this call, we will be lighting candles to remember those that we have lost since we last worshipped in this building together. O oh, ancient of days, you have been our dwelling place from generation to generation. Here in your ground of love, even death becomes a time of seed planting from which new life eternally springs forth. We give thanks, O oh God, for your life and love that have no end. On this day, we remember those who have gone before us in faith, hope, and love. We remember those who have joined us in the communion of the church and others we have joined in the communion of life. You may be seated. Good morning, beloved Lorraine Avenue community. We pause for this moment in time to mark out the specific time and place to remember those who we have lost since we last met in this building together, nearly 20 months ago. We also pause to remember those who we have lost throughout our lives. Christina and I will begin with just a few short words, and then we will read a list of names of those who have died in our congregation since we last met. And candle lighters who were close to them will come forward and light one of the li nine large candles on the table. And after those candles have been lit, uh, Erica will play some music, and uh, others can come forward and light a candle for their loved one. And if you would like to say their, your loved one's name in the microphone, you may. Um, and if you place a candle in this bowl of sand, start from the back and then move forward to avoid burns. Thank you, Christina. All right, let us begin, beloveds. This morning, we remember our loved ones who have died. We especially remember those from our congregation who have died since we last met. We look different than we once did and we remember those we love who have gone before us. Those who have impacted our lives and continue to do so. And we take heart and remember God's promise of eternal life. Though we mourn the absence of many, we celebrate God's continuing presence. We listen for the divine voice in ancient words of scripture. We hear of miracles and promises of death being swallowed up forever. Through sorrow and through joy, let us worship our holy God. Luverna Dirksen. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Luverna's life and for your love that has no end. For Marianne James. We give you thanks, O God, for Marianne's life and for your love that has no end. For John Siemens, we give you thanks, O oh God, for John's life and your love that has no end.
for Morris Birch. We, we give you thanks, O oh God, for Morris's life and your love that has no end. For Esther Schmidt. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Esther's life and for your love that has no end. For Virgil Avey. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Virgil's life and for your love that has no end. For Judy Logan Bill. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Judy's life and for your love that has no end. Barbara Waltner. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Barbara's life and for your love that has no end. For Dwayne Trog. We give you thanks, O oh God, for Dwayne's life and for your love that has no end. And for other loved ones who have gone before us.
I'm remembering my uncle Clyde Gehring and my brother-in-law Emil Kreider. We give you thanks, O God, for the lives of our beloveds and for your love that has no end. Thank you. We give you thanks, O God, for the lives of those who have gone before us, for the ways in which our stories were intertwined. Thank you, God, for life and for reminders to live it fully and to honor those we love. We are selfish and we wish we could keep our loved ones close always. And yet, gracious God, creator of all things good, we commend the spirits of our loved ones to you and to your care. We trust in your goodness and your mercy to care for them until we meet again. Amen. O oh God, in their death, we feel the pain of absence. In their death, through the unity of Christ, we also know the joy of continued presence. May the great cloud of witnesses bless and sustain our daily living. We give thanks, O oh God, for your life and love that have no end. Amen. The opening hymn is For All the Saints, number 672 in Sing the Journey. We will sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 6, and I invite you to stand. Oh, and voices together. Sorry about that. Voices together, number 672. <laughs>
invite the children to come forward now with a time with Eldon. children today did you go trick-or-treating yeah. what did you get I know candy yeah not very much yeah that's probably a good thing <laughs> well I have a book called magic eye a new way of looking at the world and it it is a book full of pictures I'll show you some, like there, Ooh. like there, and like, like there. It looks like a bunch of squiggly lines, basically. But the instructions say, if you look at it a certain way, you can see that there is another picture inside each of these pictures. Now, I've tried and tried to look at that. <laughs> I hold it up close like this, and I try to look through the book. That's what it said. But I have real trouble seeing it. I took it to a family reunion once, and the kids there were pretty good at seeing them. Maybe you kids can see pictures within a picture. I'll tell you, when the worship service is over, if you want to take a look at this book, come find me, and you can look, and maybe you can see the picture that is inside the picture. But anyway, it made me think, maybe sometimes what we see, or we think we see, isn't everything that there is. Maybe sometimes somebody looks happy, but if we could see inside of them, we would see that they're also feeling sad or lonely. Or maybe sometimes when somebody is really angry, if we could see inside, we would see that they're afraid, that they're feeling hurt, that they need somebody to love them and hug them. And I was thinking maybe, maybe faith is kind of like that. It's hard to, to see God. We can't see God. God is invisible. We can see what God makes the trees and the flowers and the people and everything. But maybe faith is like looking at a book like this, like this. There, are, there is more to faith than knowing. In fact, I think, I used to think that faith meant I had no doubts. I knew everything about God and I knew I was going to heaven and everything was okay. But I've come to believe that faith means that I choose to follow Jesus, even though I don't know everything, but I follow Jesus as best I understand and as best I can. So maybe sometimes when you see somebody and they look one way, be open to the possibility that there's more going on and that there's a picture inside the picture. Thank you. You can go. Thank you, Eldon. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the part in our service where we would normally pass the offering plate, but we are not, not doing that at this time. Um, remember, though, that you may still make your financial contributions by placing it in the stationary location in the back or by visiting the church website and clicking the offering link and you can pay online. Please join me in prayer. God, 
We give you our most sincere thanks on this All Saints Sunday, not only for the gifts of body and mind that you bless us with each day, but also for the spirit of those that have gone down this life path before us. Where death goes, sadness nearly always follows, dear Lord, but it is their time and deeds in life that we remember and cherish the most. May you look after the spirits of our departed just as you looked over them when they lived here on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. The next hymn is Nothing is Lost on the Breath of God in Voices Together, number 653. Our scripture reading will come from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 24. I will be reading from the New International Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. God said to the woman, he said, the serpent said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. You must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Thank you, Madeline. And good morning, beloveds. This is perhaps a, a strange passage to preach from on All Souls Day. And yet I wanted to take a slightly different route and talk about souls that were left, that left us long, long ago. And the reason I want to do this is because of one of my favorite things to preach about, and that is context. Context is so very important. The Genesis account of creation and the introduction of sin in the world is a lot. It's weighty. Historically, it has been used to demean women and state that God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, <laughs> and any other number of hurtful things. It has also been used to point out the beauty of creation coming from the divine creator, pointing out, but not necessarily explicitly naming, that everything we need is here, provided by God through the earth. One of the things that I've worked through with the creation story is that it is also a product of context. Jewish folks at this time, when this creation story was written, were surrounded by an empire, and that empire was Babylon. Babylon was a threat that was always looming near to the, to the Jews, and Babylon's creation story was one marked with extreme violence. Now, this is a, a gross oversimplification of the long story of Gilgamesh and the creation story of the Babylonians, but to summarize, um, Babylon's creation story begins with many gods who are in various states of relationship with each other, much like the Greeks and the Romans. Eventually, a new god comes and is birthed and arises to power named Marduk. Marduk is given creation or given control over the four winds of the earth, and all the other gods begin to fear Marduk because of his uncontrollable, unpredictable, great strength. Marduk says that just as he is, he is stronger than all of them. The gods gather together and contact one of the most ancient and primordial goddesses in their, of their kind, Tiamat. 
the goddess of the seas. They beg her to control Marduk, who has created uncontrollable hurricanes to show off his power. He has told the gods that he will become the king over all of them. And Tiamat agrees to battle with Marduk to save the rest of her kind. Though ultimately she succumbs to Marduk and perishes. Marduk then uses her body to create the heavens and the earth. And all of the various living creatures on the earth. And uses her various body parts to create different areas. And this violent creation story was pervasive around the time and this culture, this area. Now, the creation story of the Jews that we heard is almost a response to this story. Rather than creating the world out of violence and chaos, God sends their divine breath, their Holy Spirit, to hover over the waters of chaos perhaps the very waters that Marduk and Tiamat were fighting in. Then God creates everything out of nothing. God creates humans out of the fertile soil that has been created. And God rests. When the human creatures are living in the Garden of Eden of creation, they, what might you say, they maybe took it for granted. They got bored of such abundance. And eventually, they are swayed by the serpent who twists the words of the creator and convinces them that they don't have quite everything that they need. They could attain something even more abundant, knowledge. So there is so much goodness and juiciness in this text, and I would love to talk more about that story. There are some incredible feminists and liberationists takes on Eve and how she gives of herself and opens up a new chapter in humanity's story. How Eve was curious and her curiosity was demonized and considered dangerous enough, and she considered herself dangerous enough to imagine a better world than there was. But that is a sermon for another day. And as a short aside, I have to say I find it bizarre that in our country, our nation today, something that we often demonize because of religious reasons is knowledge and the pursuit of knowledge. And I wonder if that has anything to do with the creation story that we, so, that we hold on to. The knowledge of good and evil separated the human creatures from their creator in this divine story. And so as I think about these creation stories, I wonder what stories we are steeped in here today. What, what are the questions that we ask ourselves? What are the ways we view ourselves within these stories? Currently, the United States is an empire. Christianity is the empire. We are the Babylon of old. And I can think of a number of stories that I would love to tell, but the ones that I, I wish that our stories were more intertwined with would be the society of the peoples who lived on this nation, on this land before we arrived, before our ancestors arrived. And so the story that I will, would like to tell today is the creation story of the Potawatomi peoples. The Potawatomi peoples lived around the Great Lakes and cared for that land for generations and generations. Eventually, they were forcibly and violently removed from the Great Lakes regions and brought to this area and south of here. This story is also shared by or has many similarities to other indigenous tribes and peoples of that time and talk about the origins of Turtle Island or what we now call North and South America. And as members of the empire of Christianity and the United States, we have been shaped by the creation story of the Jewish peoples that was adopted by Christians. 
And I wonder what might happen if we listened more to the creation story of the Potawatomi. And you can read more about this story in Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, or there are various other accounts online as well. So this is the story of Sky Woman. Before Turtle Island was created, there were the Sky People. They lived in harmony and bliss, and one day the tree of life was knocked down. It is not known whether it was pushed or if it fell, but as it, fe as it fell, the roots left large holes in the ground of Sky World. And one day, Sky Woman looks down to what is below from Sky World. And as she peers over the side, holding on to one of the roots of the tree, she falls. Is she pushed? Does she slip? Does she jump? No one quite knows how she falls, but she falls down. And she falls for what feels like an eternity. And as she's falling, there is a consortment of water creatures in the waters of their creation. And they see this strange creature falling from the sky. And so they discuss how they might help this creature who is falling and falling and falling. And they send the geese up to stop her fall. And the geese aren't able to stop her fall, but they, they slow the fall so that the rest of the animals can decide how to best help this creature who is falling. And ultimately, Great Turtle decides that she will allow the woman to land on her back until they are able to find a better solution. Because they know they will not be able to return her to wherever it is she fell from. And so the geese and other birds gently place her on the back of Great Turtle, and they speak of rumors of this stuff at the bottom of the waters called Earth. And various animals try and try and try to swim as deep as they can to get some Earth for Sky Woman to stand on. None of them succeed until finally Small Muskrat decides that she will help and she swims down and down and down, and she is gone for what feels like an eternity. And the other animals worry that she will not succeed. And then finally, slowly, her lifeless body comes back to the surface, and her tiny paw is holding a small handful of earth. And so Sky Woman, grateful for the sacrifice of Muskrat, places the earth on the back of, turtle, of Great Turtle, and she begins to sing and dance a song of gratitude for the life that has been given so that her life can continue. And she dances around the earth on the back of the Great Turtle, and as she sings and dances with the animals, the earth grows and expands on the back of Great Turtle until Turtle Island is formed. And as Sky Woman fell, as she was holding on to the roots of the tree of life in her world, she, ha she has a handful of seeds that she carried with her down. And she plants those seeds on the earth that is on the turtle's back. And from those seeds grow all living plants that she needed to survive the plants that make up Turtle Island to be the luscious place that it is. And she sings in gratitude with the animals that helped her. And one of, one of the most interesting and important parts of this story is that every piece of it begins with gratitude for Sky Woman. She is grateful for the geese who lower her fall. She is grateful for the turtle that allows her to rest on her back. She is grateful for Muskrat who gives up her life. And she creates a contract with the animals, the creatures of this area, that she, or they offer their lives for her to survive and for the baby that she carries in her belly to survive. And in response with gratitude, she promises that she will never take more life than she absolutely needs and that they will work together with the plants and the animals to create a place where all work together in harmony 
and gratitude because there is abundance on Turtle Island. Now these three accounts of creation all hold such vivid and colorful imagery and ultimately end up shaping and reinforcing the worldviews of the people who claim those stories as their own. Babylonians were hell-bent on power and control. They wanted to create an empire like Marduk did, and so they did, violently. Must that have been because of how violent and controlling Marduk was? Marduk, the king of their gods, created his empire from, with bloody means. Why wouldn't they follow suit? The Jews and ultimately the Christians had this understanding that we were separated from the divine creator because of actions that we took, because of sin. And this created space for heightened focus on sin and how to overcome sin and how to remove those who have sinned and also how to find forgiveness from that sin to repair the relationship with the divine creator and to ultimately allow those who follow the creator to, to be the best versions of themselves. And the story has a complicated history with cementing the patriarchy by saying that Adam was given power over Eve and therefore men have control over women. And then there is the story of Sky Woman. Traditionally, the Potawatomi peoples always begin with gratitude. Gratitude for Mother Earth and her many gifts. Gratitude for the animals who they see as equal and who offer themselves for food because they promise to use the original instructions to take only what is needed and never more. Gratitude for the plants who offer their lives as well and the promise to care for them and again to take only what is needed. Gratitude in these relationships is intertwined and integral to the relationships themselves. Humans are fed and clothed and housed because of life that was given by beloveds in their communities. And what can humans do in response for this great gift but to treat the earth and all of her creatures with gratitude, to assist and protect the earth as it, in every way as possible. And for me, I see our current context, and I see a country and perhaps a church that is divided. We have different ideals and expectations than others, and we sometimes expect others to bend to our expectations and our goals rather than being willing to bend ourselves. And I wonder what might change if we changed our attitudes to come together because we are in the midst of violence rather than seeing the violence and choosing a side to fight. What are ways that we might support each other in our efforts, in our pains, if nothing else at all, I want to choose gratitude more often, to see the ways that lives are given so that mine can continue, to see the good that is all around me. And so I wonder, friends, beloveds, what are the stories that we steep ourselves in? I wonder if, like Eve, you might be willing to take a bite of that forbidden fruit not quite sure what it brings, but trusting that there is more to the life that we live in. Perhaps like Tiamat, you might be willing to fight for your siblings, for your beloveds, even if it means sacrificing yourself in the process. And I wonder if like Sky Woman, you might be willing to take that leap into a wholly new and unknown world beyond our imagining being willing to work with those who are already there to create an environment of gratitude and abundance where all needs are met. Most of all, may we live lives in ways that the women of old might only dream of. May we trust in the wisdom of the divine creator and the stories of the souls of those who've gone before us. May it be so, amen.
Good morning. We have come to the point in our service where we continue in our worship by sharing in the work of our church. As I said, this is a part of our worship service. We bring our joys, our concerns, our announcements to one another and to God. Um, I will start. Our sending hymn is in Voices Together 814. Friends, as we go from this place, may we go knowing that you are fully known and beloved by God. Let us go praising God for the gifts that we have, for creation which provides what we need, and for the good news of Jesus. May we go in the living message of those who have gone before us and those who will come after us. Let us go with the gift of God's grace, peace, and love. Amen.